Okay, so if you are among the pioneers watching these for the first time, um, we've had a little bit of a break, so welcome back. Episode 11, the 11th century. So this would be, one more time, the 11th century is from 1000, from 1000, right, to 1099. We're always off by 100 years. Um, as always, watch to the end, check out the final slide, look at the sources that I'm using. These are not my pieces of art. These are not my graphs and maps. These are the product of many people's hard work and they've shared them on the internet and I am sharing them with you. So be sure that you understand those sources when you're finished watching. So, um, the 10 hundreds. So we'll start out into, um, in the East, in India. So, um, by the year 1000, a man named Mahmud, who is an Afghani, he is um, a Muslim, he's a militant um, Muslim believer, and he's basically secured his rule in India. He's vowed to take the word of Allah to the Hindu kingdoms of India every year if necessary, by sword and by fire. And um, so this is um, a painting of his court. So um, most of northern India is being ruled by, by Muslims right now. Okay, and absolutely on the other half of the world. Um, in 1002, a man named Leif Erikson leaves Greenland and takes an expedition of 34 men to the coast of what will be North America. Uh, so this is Eric the Red's son. So we see Eric the Red came from Iceland and then the dark blue, his son Leif, Eric's son, there you go, um, comes into North America. So if you would like to see this statue of Leif Erikson, you don't have to go to Greenland. It's actually in Duluth, Minnesota, which is quite a hike, but uh, it's not as far as Greenland. In Sweden, the king, his name is Olaf, um, converts to Christianity, and as we hopefully have figured out figured out the pattern when the king converts to Christianity, so does everybody else in the country, all right? So as far as Swedish history is concerned, the reign of King Olaf, Olaf I, is considered the transition from the Viking Age to the Middle Ages, okay? So that moment of conversion, um, and we could have a debate about the genuineness of their spirituality, and that's not the point. That moment of conversion is historically significant. Okay, um, the Swedes actually are the last of the Scandinavian countries to adopt Christianity. So um, this is a guy who's just now getting with the program um, when everybody else has been doing it for a while. So this picture is um, a grave called the Olaf grave, and it's at a church called Husseby in Sweden. And since the 1100s, so uh, it's not immediate, but since the 1100s, this has claim to be the burial, burial site of King Olaf. Don't have any evidence that it isn't his grave, but we don't have any evidence that it is either. Um, if it makes you feel better, there's no place for the rival claim. There's not another grave that claims to be. So that's nice. And it's just, um, this is something amazing. When, when you get the chance to travel in Europe and you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna find um, the grave of a famous composer or the grave of a famous king, or a, bo a pope, and, and you'll be walking along, minding your own business in this out of the way place, and you know, completely out of the blue, you'll be like, oh my gosh, there's Pius V or whatever, um, just right there, right next to you, and you had no idea. It's, it's not like walking up to the Taj Mahal, you know, these things are not obvious, and sometimes it's really amazing just how humble the burial of one of these um, very important characters ends up being. Um, so that's funny. So I, I believe it just based on that experience I've had of other people's um, graves. You're going really, wow, this is it. So if this really is the Olaf grave. I, I buy that. Sounds good to me. So back the other direction again. Um, this is the problem with going chronologically. You get um, geographic whiplash. So in 1010, um, India is weakened by a variety of, of divisions. The Hindu 
um, empires that do exist in between the Muslim invasions don't get along, so they're fighting, so that weakens their defenses. And um, we have Muslims coming down through this pass in the mountains. This is the Khyber Pass. And they're, now they're coming down on horseback, and they're raiding the temple towns in northwest India, which is the Indus Valley. And they're carrying back stuff, right? Wealth stolen from temples, um, all kinds of stuff like this. And so the Indians work out a deal with Mahmud, the Afghani ruler who's sending these raiding parties. Like, okay, we will send you annual tribute. Please stop attacking and taking our stuff. So um, trains of elephants cross the pass into Afghanistan uh, every year to take tribute to um, the ruler in Afghanistan. Uh, so this is, we're on the India side of the pass and we are looking north and kind of west into, into Afghanistan, I believe. Let me make sure I'm not telling you wrong. Yeah. So anyway, the Khyber Pass, this is a modern photograph. Obviously this is, this is today. Um, the Khyber Pass still exists. It's in, it's in Pakistan, modern Pakistan. All right, and the other direction again, here we go. Um, back to the Vikings. So in 1015, a 21 year old Dane, whose name is Knut, invades England with a fleet. Okay, and the area is marked in dark red, by the end of his life, this, the dark red is the extent of his reign. And um, he's going to be a really interesting person. So this is King Canute the Great, or Canute the um, First, if you like. And this is him in this, um, this is part of a manuscript. This is, that's the letter H he's sitting inside. This is the first um, part of, a, of an illuminated book. So we've got Canute. In England, the other direction again, in 1020, um, the, um, a man named Avicenna, so what we are going to call him because we're Westerners, um, is sort of at the peak of his life. Now, Avicenna is important, and we could spend actually quite a lot of time talking about him and his influence on our culture. But, so... Abu Ali al Husayn ibn Abd Allah ibn Sina is his name. All right, no way is anybody going to go through all that trouble. So Ibn Sina, which is the very, very last part of his name, becomes what everybody calls him, Avicenna. Um, so he is um, in the middle of a very prolific lifetime of writing. He, he um, by the time he's done, he's written 276 different little books. Um, they're not all very long, but he writes on medicine, physics, astronomy, chemistry, mathematics, economics, religion. He's an empiricist, which means he does experiments and records the results. He's interested in rationalism and scientific thought. Um, the idea that there are things you can test. Um, there are things that you can know by trying and trying and seeing what the results are. Um, in, in the physical world. Um, the, this is the guy who starts, or sorry, who carries on the work of earlier, less organized Muslim scientists and philosophers and really gives us a truly amazing body of philosophical work. And, um, Again, mathematics, economics, all that stuff. But it's really the, the philosophy. He goes back to the Greeks and says, okay, how do the Greeks figure things out? What's their process? What is, and it's not called the scientific method, but how do they figure things out? And by looking at it, by seeing if there's some rule you can draw from it, well, does the rule apply somewhere else? Okay, no. Well, maybe it's not a good rule. Okay, well, what about this rule? Does it apply somewhere else? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll keep that rule and we'll keep trying it. Till we find the flaws in it okay this idea of rational thought scientific thought um which we're going to find his writings when we go into the middle east during the crusades and go whoa this dude is really smart we should learn this stuff too um but anyway he's not super popular amongst his fellow muslims they believe that he is um 
not quite blasphemous, but certainly very much um, not pious for doing all this learning science experiment -y stuff. That seems to be a contradiction um, and a denial of faith on the part of um, these very strictly observant Muslims. Um, so he has some issues with that, but he'll be fine. Um, you can still get his Canon on Medicine. Uh, it has a five-star rating on Amazon. You can buy it. Um, and the pictures here, this, there's an etching of him on the right, and then this is the first page of the Canon on Medicine. And this is actually a Persian copy of it, so the language that's written in is called Farsi, which is the language spoken in Iran. This is, obviously this is not modern Farsi, but that's okay. So again, his name is Avicenna. Very important. Good to know about. Back to the white people who keep fighting. Okay, so in 1022, um, we have this very interesting French king, is Robert the Pious. And I laughed, the first time I put this together, I laughed myself silly, because in French that would be Robert Le Pew. And the fact that it's Le Pew is just like, that's, trust me, it's super funny. Okay, so Robert is the son of Hugh Capet which would make him the second of the Capetian kings, C-A-P-A-T-I-A-N, Capetian. If you feel like writing things down, that would be something to write down, the Capetian kings of France, okay. Um, Robert has been the king for a while, okay, um, at this point, and uh, so the picture that I chose here, this is an 1875 painting by Jean-Paul Lorraine, and this is an episode from earlier in Robert's life. He had gotten married to a woman who is his niece, um, which is not unusual, but you're supposed to get a dispensation from the Pope first, and he didn't do it. So the Pope's like, okay, you need to separate. You need to get divorced. This was not an appropriate marriage. You didn't do your paperwork. And Robert's like, no, I don't want to. And so this scene is Pope Gregory the fifth is leaving that's him walking out the door he's leaving the king's courtroom after pronouncing an excommunication all right so now we all know if this had been henry the eighth right we know how he would have handled it but um that's not what happens here robert starts this very long series of negotiations with the pope and they go back and forth and back and forth and eventually the pope does give him um he agrees to have his marriage with her name is Bertha, the woman in white, with um, this niece. Um, he, he agrees to have that annulled. And then he gets correctly married to some other person. Okay. And then he goes on to be the king. He's, again, he's called Robert the Pious. You're like, didn't you just say he was called Robert the Pious? And here he's got this marriage problem. Um, he's known as Robert the Pious primarily because he was very enthusiastic about um, stamping out heresy in in within his kingdom okay making sure that nobody who is preaching or teaching or acting or thinking in a way that's contrary to church doctrine he's making sure that they are not um, allowed to be out there doing that and so that's where his name Robert the Pious comes from so interesting fellow we, we will come back to the Capetian kings at some point so back to Canute, okay? Um, Canute was a young guy last time we talked about him. He's a little older. Uh, he goes to Norway and he occupies Norway with a fleet of 50 ships. And with the help of the local lords, the Norwegian nobles, he drives uh, the Norwegian king, whose name is Olaf, into exile. Um, very much like every other group of monarchs, we're gonna have like Olaf and Sven then Olaf, then Olaf, then Sven, and you're like, can we pick a different name? Nope. Well, yep, once in a while we'll get a herald. Okay. Um, he drives the Norwegian king into exile, and he becomes also the king of Norway. Okay, this is Olaf. This wooden statue here is Olaf. So Canute is now also the king of Norway, but he's not very good at being the king of Norway because he doesn't stay there in person. He stays in England, which is his primary kingdom. And what do you think happens to your new territory if you don't keep your butt there and watch over it. Yep, that's right, he loses it. 
Um, so if you can read the numbers on the map, it's a little hard to read. So it says 1028 to 1035 Danish. That's as long as it lasted. Not even It's not even seven full years before Norway reverts to rule by um, the local Norwegians. So this is sort of a failed expedition, I suppose, um, if you want to think of it that way, uh, on, on the part of Canute. But he's got a solid hold on England, a solid hold on Denmark, make, takes a shot at Nor Norway and can't quite make that one stick. Meanwhile, more, um, more heretics and more burnings. In 1034, the Archbishop of, Barch Archbishop of, <laughs> of Milan, whose name is Eribert, of course it is, um, seizes members of a group that, is re that rejects infant baptism and, important, is preaching the rejection of infant baptism. That's usually an important stage. Okay, believing something wrong and then you get corrected. Preaching something wrong and refusing to change, that'll get you burned. So he has these guys burned to death. Um, and he's an interesting character for many reasons. He's a famous guy with a well-known name that people would still recognize today in this northern part of Italy. And he's, he's not a bad example of a typical bishop for the day. He was better at it, but he's kind of a warrior bishop. He's fighty, okay? His hobby is being a pain to the Holy Roman Emperor. And um, as is almost always the case at this time, you know, a bishop is just as much a political figure as a spiritual one. And it's something to keep in mind through this entire time period. Like, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've, I've said that multiple times at this point. Um, keep in mind, their political authority is real, okay? And the fact that they're also a spiritual authority, honestly, in many places, is secondary. So in um, Herbert's case... He's basically an, a, a regional hero. If there were a, such a thing as a nation in northern Italy at this time, we'd say he's a national hero. He, he unified all the cities of northern Italy in the area that today we would call Lombardy. And um, is, this, is this great, important political character. And also archbishop, as you see. Um, so that's Eriber. So he's burning heretics and unifying northern Italy. And yay, good for him. Let's move on. Okay, where are we? India. Back to India. Um, so this is 1040. And um, so be careful with dates for China, for Japan, for anywhere in the Far East. Our dates are not great because we don't have the same year recording system as these other great civilizations. So, in the neighborhood of 1040, um, a, a dynasty called the Chola, who have been ruling South India, have also now conquered the island of Sri Lanka. Okay, um, and the beginnings of the caste system are starting to develop. You have the very wealthy at the top. Um, you do have free peasants, but then you also have laborers who are are like serfs, they're almost slaves, and they are a caste of their own, and, and so on and so forth down the um, down the chain. Um, this sculpture on the left and the temple on the right, um, these are both from the time of a very successful king um, from this civilization whose name is Rajendra. So it's just a nice example of the art, the statue itself, um, this is called a relief, by the way, when you're sticking out partway from a wall. You're like sculpted into a flat surface. That's a relief. And then the temple. So just kind of cool. You can visit these places. Okay, so here we go. Randomly chosen date and apparently a graphic on global warming. And you're like, what is she showing us? So let's talk about why we stopped here. So 1050 is considered the beginning of the high middle ages okay what does that what does that mean okay this is an arbitrary choice of date and that's an arbitrary name for this time period but let's talk about how we got to it and um 
and talk about why you need to know about it. Okay, so first of all, 1050 is easy to remember. We love things that are even and easy to remember. So there you go, 1050. Um, I already said we've got apparently a global temperatures map. Let's talk about what kinds of things you can do with numbers. All right, so you can see this is supposed to be a measure of the average global temperature over time. Okay, and without discussing whether or not the data is accurate, we'll just presume the way they got the data is mostly accurate, or at least it's consistent. Okay, if the temperatures are wrong, the relationships between them at least are consistent. Um, there is some science behind this. Basically, just so you know, the fossil records um, that we can get by digging down into the ground um, allow us to get a gauge of temperature, and that is that comes from the chemical breakdown evident in organisms caught in the sediment. Okay, so that sounds like very complicated, but it, it does. There's it's a legitimate way of determining the temperature at a certain time in history. It's, you know, anyway, so we'll move past all that. We'll just presume again. We're going to presume that if the data is off, it's at least internally consistent, meaning the relationships between the highs and lows are recorded the same way for all of time. That's what I'm saying. Isn't it interesting how these times with warmer temperatures, that's the red half, track with peaks in the development of civilization? Okay. So why am I bringing this up now? High Middle Ages, I will tell you. One thing that you're seeing happen with the warmer temperatures is it is so much easier to farm and grow stuff when the weather is good, okay? And warm is good, cold is bad, okay? In our day and age, you know, global warming, oh, we're all gonna die. No, global warming is great, okay? You know, longer growing season, fewer plants are dying, all kinds of amazing, wonderful things happen. So the high middle ages, which is 1050. So this is the one, two, three, fourth red hump here. Okay, the toward the beginning of that, the high middle ages corresponds with a spike in agricultural um, activity. Okay, the more agriculture, the better your agricultural system is functioning the larger and more stable your towns and cities become, which leads to cultural growth. Okay, the more people that can live in the same place and develop relationships, develop trade guilds, build churches, create governments, the more complex your, your culture is going to get. All right, so again, without any socioeconomic or political implications, you can look at these records of temperature over time and go, hey, that's pretty interesting. Like, for example, you'll notice there aren't actual temperatures, like degrees on here. Okay, but the patterns that we can see patterns, we can look back at history and go, oh, this is really interesting. What's happening here? Why Sumeria, Egypt, Rome? Okay, so that's a lot of it. And I thought that was interesting. And I've inflicted upon you, and I'm done. Okay, now, what's going on with the East and the West? Okay, so we got a nice map here. We got a Pope, we got a Patriarch. What's happening? So, the year is 1054. So the church in Rome has a long-standing doctrinal dispute with the church in Constantinople. Okay, they go back and forth. This is not news to anybody. So the church in Rome today, right now, 1054, is accusing the patriarchs in Constantinople of doing a variety of things, such as allowing priests to marry, rebaptizing Roman Christians using their Eastern formula, and deleting the phrase, and the son, from the Nicene Creed. Okay, um, and that's not completely accurate. Um, they weren't deleting the phrase from the Nicene Creed. They weren't using it in the first place. Um, 
So we'll let that part go. So basically, the church in Rome excommunicates the church in Constantinople. And the church of Constantinople excommunicates the church in Rome. And this is the great schism. Okay, the schism between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy becomes final. Okay, they, they, they've, they have cut ties. Or we've been, um, we've been on the road for this for a while. It's now, you know, the deed is done. So, another time out from our regularly scheduled quick progress through history. If you are using the F. Smitha page for your timelines, this is a good example of a mistake. Okay, and I just said it. It's on the Smitha page. It says it's untrue that the phrase and the sun was being removed from the creed by Eastern Catholics. Okay, and I, I agreed with that. It is untrue, but it's really sloppy history. Okay, as far as the writing for the website goes, it's poorly done because it makes it sound like, like what was your presumption when I read that? It sounds like the Roman church is lying about the Eastern church, that they're doing things under false pretenses, okay? What would be more accurate would be to say that in the, the Roman church beginning in 1014, back when it was still one church, right? Met and there were representatives from Constantinople at this meeting, they met and confirmed that the phrase and the son had to be included in the creed that was professed during liturgy. Okay, this wasn't about what's the creed got in it. It was which creed do we have to use during liturgy? Okay, because the Eastern churches had basically just said, okay, all right, well, that's a nice creed, but we're not going to use it when we actually pray. Okay, um, so in 1014, all of the bishops and popes and patriarchs who were available got together and said, okay, yeah, you have to have and the son in the creed that you're using during liturgy. Okay. The creed with that phrase in it was not new. Does anybody remember? It was with Constantine back in 325 that that creed was even written. Okay. So what's happening in 1054 is the Romans are accusing the Easterners of failing to conform to the agreement from 1014 about which creed do you use during your liturgy. Okay, so the Romans are not falsely accusing the Eastern churches of anything to do with the phrase, okay, but to say they were deleting it would not be true. Okay, well, that's because it's poorly written, and this is, this is my point. This is a long tangent. Be careful with your sources. Use more than one. If it's got anything to do with the church, try and find a Catholic source. Um, I have suggestions I can send you. One of uh, there's a really good one. It's just it's newadvent.org. Okay, like newadvent.org. Okay, or the Catholic Encyclopedia. Just watch for that. Be careful, because while it's not completely, it's not false. It's badly written, and it leads you to this negative impression of what the church is doing, which is just inaccurate. Okay, and, and it's misleading. So anyway, 1054, big moment. Pretty sure this is your key fact for this century. Okay, that's it. All right, I'm done with tangents. We will move more quickly from now on. In 1055, the Seljuk Turks are moving westward, I cannot speak, into Persia, which is about where the word Seljuks is on this map, okay? This would be modern Iran. Um, and Islam's having troubles, okay? They're having some internal disputes. They're somewhat fragmented, and they can't rally to defend their frontier, right? So the Arab Muslims of the Arabian Peninsula, all the way up to Damascus and Baghdad, can't get it together. So the Turks conquer Persia, and they create a dynasty, the Fatimid dynasty, and they... Um, no, read that wrong. They conquer Baghdad, which is um, being run by the Fatimid dynasty. Okay. And that leaves the Fatimids with just this little bit of, of um, northern Africa. Okay. I'm going to do that whole thing again because that seems like it's confusing. 
the Turks are coming from Asia, right? Far right of the map. They come through what used to be the Persian Empire that has been part of Islam. They overrun the Arabs and then they, they push the Arabs uh, west toward the Byzantine Empire um, where they are fighting with the Byzantines and also south into Africa. So the green is the Fatimid Arabs. Okay, those are the Muslims that did, used to rule Baghdad and now they're in Northern Europe. Okay, and the Turks are now ruling everything left over. Turks are, are mostly Muslim themselves. Okay, they adopt Islam, but they fight with the Muslims who are already in this area. Next. Okay, meanwhile, what's going on? In 1060, the Almoravids, who are puritanical fundamentalist Islamic reformers in North Africa, okay? Um, have been preaching, teaching, building an army, and they move from their initial base on the Mauritanian coast, and they seize power in Morocco. So they come north into Morocco. That's where Marrakesh is. And also into part of Western Algeria. Okay. <clears throat> so they start out at the bottom of this map, and they move north. And this shows... In a little bit into the future, you're seeing the Almoravid Empire at a later extent, where they go where, right? They go into Spain. And on the right, this is um, the Almoravid king, and he is sitting in his palace in North Africa. This is a part of a map. He's sitting in his palace in North Africa, and the guy, you can see a camel coming into the frame. This is a guy bringing him gifts and tributes. <clears throat> okay. So they move into Spain, and let's see. Um, yeah, so while we're looking at Spain, you can see that little bit of orange and city of Toledo. Okay, um, that's a little bit of the kingdom of Castile and Leon. It makes like a stripe across central Spain, like the center of modern Spain. And then above that, there's another stripe. That's the kingdom of Navarre and Aragon, okay? Um, pay attention to these names. <clears throat> um, we're going to see these separated kingdoms of Spain unite and fight back against the Muslims who are currently taking over Spain. And um, this is a good time to remind you a, to not get confused, or you can get confused. Don't get c discouraged. A, this is complicated and confusing. Okay. B, this is not the ideal way to learn it all right and i that's fine um but also because this is an advanced skill this is a key thing that we're trying to learn how to do here so much of studying history is looking backward and remembering how it was and also looking forward and realizing how it will be right okay how long has it been it seems like 15 minutes since we were talking about um people coming across north africa we're talking about the visigoths coming down through Spain into Africa. Now we've got people coming from Africa through Spain. <clears throat> What's going on? Okay, this is called contextualization. Remembering what happened here before, looking forward and knowing what's gonna happen here later. Okay, like what's gonna happen after Spain is finally reconquered, the last Muslim city falls when? In like 1490, okay? And then Columbus sails the ocean blue. Okay, contextualization, key skill, difficult skill, right? Because it requires you remembering how something looks after I've changed the map on you, right? I said, okay, here's a new image. What did it look like 10 minutes ago? Well, I don't know. That was 10 minutes ago. It's hard to remember, okay? So if I refer backward or forward in history, you're needing to remember multiple things that I may not be showing you right at this moment, okay? And that's challenging, and we're all doing great. Okay, that takes us to 1066. Hopefully you can tell me what happens in 1066 without me having to say it first, right? Of course right. All right, so the Battle of Hastings. Um, this is just a little piece of a huge piece of artwork that's called the Bio Tapestry. 
Uh, we could do a whole class on the tapestry. We could do a whole class on the battle. We could do a whole class on William the First of Normandy. Um, but that doesn't fit on our time frame. So here's the summary. In 1066, William the First, the conqueror of Normandy, ends Anglo-Saxon rule in England by defeating Harold at the Battle of Hastings, and he becomes the first Norman king of England. All right. And this is the beginning of our absorption of the French language into English, too. This is the, the melting together of Anglo-Saxon and French. Okay? And yet another thing we could do many, many classes on. Um, in 1073, someone who is very important finally actually becomes famous. Okay, so there's this guy. He grew up poor. He was educated in a monastery school in Rome. He became a monk. He becomes the Pope's personal chaplain. And then when the Pope dies, he stays in a position of influence. And word starts to get around that this guy is, like, really good at organizing. He's a great leader. He makes great decisions. He can handle disputes. You name it. He's the everything man. And, of course, so the next time there's a chance to get a new Pope, the people want to make him Pope. His name is Hildebrand, and he is like, no, I do not want it. Please get it far away from me. And um, <clears throat> he can't stop it forever. In 1073, Hildebrand the monk is elected Pope Gregory VII using a system that he had suggested. Today we call it the College of Cardinals, where the cardinals get together and elect, it's mostly by blind ballot, elect a pope instead of kind of you know whoever's the most powerful guy today gets to pick the next pope okay gregory the seventh was a great man he brought order and reform to the church in a time when everything else is kind of really still off the rails um he is a canonized saint you should read more about him um, but for now pope gregory the seventh thumbs up good guy okay so here's your Almoravid uh, Muslims again. So this is the guys from the western edge of Africa, the green map from a couple slides ago. Um, they declare on the war on the non-Muslim kingdoms of Africa. And at this point, that basically means the empire of Ghana, which is further inland and more south from the Almoravids. So they're coming down into central West Africa and invading the kingdom of Ghana. And I know you guys are all super up to date and experts on your modern African geography. So I will remind you, this is not modern Ghana. Modern Ghana is on the coast way further south. This Ghana is not on the coast. It's right in the middle of the biggest part of like the nose of Africa, right? Where we all assume the Sahara Desert is. And if you remember from last century, they were the guys with the gold trading routes. So, okay, but this is not gold trading in Africa. What's happening here? In 1077, um, Hildebrand, right, Pope Gregory VII, is still pursuing his church reforms, and he's come into conflict with the Roman Emperor, right, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV, who is a descendant of Charlemagne, okay? So the issue is Gregory has put out a decree that anybody who accepts a church position offered to him by a layman will be deposed meaning if the mayor says you're bishop I will not let you be bishop and any layman who gives a church position to someone will be excommunicated right so if the mayor makes you bishop I will excommunicate the mayor right okay because um this is a problem so what happens is Henry doesn't pay attention to the rules. He names someone to be bishop, and Gregory excommunicates him. And everything sits great. The, the local nobles in the empire are like, yay, the emperor's getting what comes to him and all this stuff. So Henry crosses the Alps to Canoso in northern Italy in the winter. And he this is um, Henry in the snow outside the Pope's palace, begging for the Pope's forgiveness and apologizing and saying he'll do penance. And Gregory grants him absolution. He's like, okay, but you have to promise never to do it again, right? He's this whole firm purpose of amendment idea. 
Uh, in this event, there are many, 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 many versions of this in, in classical art. It's a pretty famous moment in history. Um, you might have sort of heard of all this drama in other classes. Um, this is the investiture controversy or the the um, the controversy of lay investiture. And it's really a lot more complicated than this, but you get the idea. Um, so if you've heard of the investiture crisis or the investiture controversy, this is this is one episode in it. OK, and Henry's like, all right, I won't appoint any more bishops. And it's just so not true in 1080. So three years later, he's back at it. He's using his power as emperor to choose and then invest, which is a verb, men with leadership positions in the church. OK, so investment would be when I give you the stuff that shows you are the authority figure. When I bring you into the church and I hand you the bishop's ring and the bishop's staff and everybody's there watching this ceremony, who do the people see giving authority to the bishop? The emperor, because he's the one handing him the ring and stuff, right? Pope's like, nope, you can't do that. You cannot invest the bishop with symbols of power, okay? You can invest the bishop with and he gives him a list of purely secular things that the bishop can be responsible for that the emperor can designate the bishop to do. Okay, and he gives them, there's another very clear list of things Henry cannot do, right? You aren't, you, you emperor dude are not making this bishop a spiritual leader. And Henry doesn't care, he still does whatever he wants. Gregory excommunicates him again. And this time Henry's like, no, well, I'm not going to go kneel in the snow again. So he does something that very few kings at this point in time can do. Um, he takes an army to Italy and takes over Rome, right? So rude. And the Pope basically becomes a prisoner in the, in the city of Rome. So the Holy Roman Emperor, maybe not quite so holy anymore. Um, takes over the city of Rome, and the bishop of Rome is um, there he is. In 1085, Pope Gregory VII dies. Here's his tomb. He's dead. Right? Quite dead. Um, this is, I believe, the cathedral in Salerno. So that would be in Sicily. Most popes are buried in Rome, but not all of them. Some of them are buried other places. Um, and uh, Henry still controls Rome, right? So when the pope dies, how do you think the next pope is going to act toward the emperor, right? So this is the problem with having a secular leader take over the pope's territory. Okay, um, more about Italy. And this is, this is terrifying to look at both these maps. You're like, oh my gosh. Um, this is another moment where we're going to talk about like how hard it is to remember all this stuff. Italy is like fluid, even at the best of times. Okay, getting a handle on what's going on in Italy has never, is not, and shall never be an easy thing. Okay, I mean, remember early in the year we were trying to sort out like the 1800s in Italy? It's like, oh my gosh, what is even going on? It's always been like that, okay? There are many, many, many things going on in Italy all the time. Almost never <laughs> is all of Italy doing the same thing at once, okay? So in this case, uh, on the left side, you can see like the Emirate of Sicily. Like Sicily is owned by Muslims, okay? Well, halfway through the century, a bunch of Norman, literal Norman pirates come in and they occupy most of Sicily. So that's where you get the country of Sicily. Okay, I just said Salerno is in Sicily a second ago. It's not, it's on the peninsula of Italy, I apologize. Um, and you got these duchies, you've got these kingdoms, you've got these principalities, it's crazy. Do not be confused by Italy. Just go, oh, it's Italy, and then move on because it's not going to be clear um, in the amount of time that we have here today. So, don't worry about it.
Yeah, that brings us to the Crusades. Almost done with this century, don't worry. Okay, so what were the Crusades? How many were there? Who started them? Where did they go? Did they all wear the same outfit? Um, what's, what's the deal with Crusades? There's a lot here. Okay, um, the answers are usually something like, it depends, no, the Pope. Okay, there's a lot to the Crusades. Um, despite the impression you get from looking at crusader memes on the internet. Um, and, you know, this is not something that we're going to get 100% comprehension on in a quick overview in a, in a, a YouTube slideshow. Okay, so don't worry about it. Um, and yes, here we're back into memes. A lot of them are really funny, but obviously many others are inappropriate. So don't go Googling crusader memes. Um, and when I was putting this together, I was reminded, um, I had a professor in college who used movie references in his classes all the time, constantly. Um, and he'd make the reference and then he'd say, oh, don't see this movie, right? Like he was, he was always talking about them, but always, then he had like his disclaimer. It's like, no, but don't see it. Don't see this movie. Uh, you can't watch that movie. Yeah, definitely don't see it. And I was like, I don't know. Um, so we will mention the Crusades, try and get some idea of what's going on, but we're not going to be able to go into a proper amount of detail, right? So. All right. Um, so in 1095, the Turks are still expanding. Um, they are still pushing back the... Um, the Eastern Roman Empire, what's left of the Byzantine Empire, and they've conquered Jerusalem. Um, but unlike the Muslims who had been occupying the Holy Land for most of this time, they will not allow Christians into the Holy Land to visit the holy sites. Okay, so the Arab Muslims were sort of meh, and the Turkish Muslims are a little more serious, and so they exclude Christians from the Holy Land. So, Pope Urban II responds to a call for help from the emperor at Constantinople, and he organizes what will later become known as the First Crusade. He doesn't call it the First Crusade. That would be strange, but that's what it's going to become. So basically, Urban is preaching, or he has, you know, talented orators preaching um, that, you know, the army of Christ is going to the Holy Land to liberate the place of his birth and life and death from these Muslims. Okay, so what's going on in this picture? I just, this is a screenshot, okay, of I was looking for this painting, which is Francesco Hayes uh, oil painting, 1835, Pope Urban preaching the first crusade in the square of Claremont. Okay, I wanted this painting, and I found out on fineartamerica.com, you can get this image on a beach towel for only $54.32. <laughs> and I thought that was very funny. Who, I'm into art and all, who would want this on a beach towel? How weird would that be? So this is, I didn't know, I don't know. I didn't see how much shipping would be. Maybe I should get one. But this is like a huge towel, first of all. It's like, what is it? Three and a half, three something feet by five something. Feet. It's big. It's like six feet long. That's a big towel. Anyway, there's nothing you can't find on the internet. <laughs> so the Pope would preach as shown in this picture and he would tell the people, join as fighters, donate money to support the army, pray for the success of the crusade. Kings are supposed to be joining with their armies and their treasure, right? And um, very important to the success of the crusade was finding a capable military leader, okay? So every crusade is going to have these three ingredients. There's a religious component, there's a political component, and there's a military component. And in every crusade, that recipe is a little bit different. Sometimes you have the same character doing two of those things, all right, or, or whatever. Um, and that just, yeah, so anyway. Um, you'll just need to analyze each crusade as you get to it and kind of get it. So the first crusade, um, they go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is besieged. And then in 1099, Jerusalem falls 
to the Crusaders, right? Or put it a different way, the Crusaders win, okay? And then what do they do? They kill almost all of the Muslim and Jewish inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem, okay? Um, and this painting is odd just because it's it's very recent. This was actually done in 1988. Um, so it's an old style, but it's like a modern painting. Um, so these are crusaders, and they're about to execute this Muslim guy that they've defeated. Um, he looks like he's kind of already dead, um, but supposedly they're they're about to kill him. Um, so the building that's in the background is the, the mosque in Jerusalem, it's, and it's called the Dome of the Rock, right? Because the temple was destroyed, so that's a mosque. Um, so the leaders of the crusade divide the Holy Land all the way down into Egypt and then north into Syria into a series of little kingdoms and they're each going to rule or protect um part of this kingdom that they're going to set up and there's a lot of destruction and a lot of killing and it's really not great um and that's going to be how they maintain control of the holy land and keep the muslims from taking back over it so on that very happy note we're done with the 11th century so congratulations, you made it. See you next time. Don't forget to take a moment to look at these sources. And we'll see you in the 1100s.